Friday, October 16, 1942. Beginning at 9 a.m., a radio transmitter secreted somewhere in the nation's capital broadcasts the voice of the First Lady, who, with the assistance of Lindbergh loyalists inside the Secret Service, has managed to escape from Walter Reed, where, alleged by authorities to be a mental patient in the care of Army psychiatrists, she had been straightjacketed and held prisoner for nearly 24 hours. The tone is appealingly gentle, the words uttered without a trace of harshness or righteous contempt, altogether the evenly paced voice of someone entirely respectable who is educated to face down sorrow and disappointment without ever losing her self-restraint. She is no cyclone, yet the undertaking is extraordinary, and she knows no fear. My fellow Americans, unlawfulness on the part of America's law enforcement agencies cannot and will not be allowed to prevail. In my husband's name, I ask all National Guard units to disarm and disband and for our government to return to civilian life. I ask, and for our guardsmen to return to civilian life, I ask all members of the United States Armed Forces to leave our cities and to regroup at their home bases under the command of their authorized senior officers. I ask the FBI to release all those arrested on charges of conspiring to harm my husband and to restore immediately their full rights as citizens. I ask law enforcement authorities throughout the nation to do the same with those who have been detained in local and state jails. There is not a shred of evidence that a single detainee is in any way responsible for whatever befell my husband and his plane on or after Wednesday, October 7th, 1942. I ask the New York City police to vacate the illegally occupied premises of government sequestered newspapers, magazines, and radio stations, and that these facilities resume their normal activities as guaranteed under the First Amendment of the Constitution. I ask the Congress of the United States to initiate proceedings to remove from office the current acting president of the United States and to appoint a new president in accordance with the Presidential Secession Act of 1886, which designates the Secretary of State as next in line for the presidency should the vice presidency be vacant. The Secession Act of 1886 also states that, under the circumstances described, Congress should decide whether to call a special presidential election. And so I ask the Congress to do just that and to authorize a presidential election that will coincide with the congressional election scheduled for the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, of November. Her morning broadcast is repeated by the First Lady every half hour until at noon she announces that in defiance of the acting president, who she charges by name with having ordered her illegal abduction and confinement, she is returning to take up residence with her children at the White House, deliberately appropriating for her peroration echoes of American democracy's most revered text. She concludes, I will not yield to or be intimidated by the, Ill the illegal representatives of a seditious administration, and I ask no more of, Amer of the American people than that they follow my example and refuse to accept or support government conduct that is indefensible. The history of the present administration is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having to the indirect object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. This government has been deaf to the voice of justice and has extended over us an unwarrantable jurisdiction. Consequently, in defense of those same inalienable rights claimed in July of 1776 by Jefferson of Virginia and Franklin of Pennsylvania and Adams of Massachusetts Bay and by the authority of the same good people of these United States and appealing to the same supreme judge of the world, for the rectitude of our intentions, I, Anne Morrow Lindbergh, a native of the state of New Jersey, a resident of the District of Columbia, and the spouse of the 33rd President of the United States, declare that injurious history of usurpation to be ended. Our enemy's plot has failed. Liberty and justice are restored. And those who have been violated, and those who have violated the Constitution of the United States, shall now be addressed by the judicial branch of government in strict keeping with the law of the land. Our Lady of the White House, as Harold Ix grudgingly christens Mrs. Lindbergh, returns to the presidential living quarters early that evening, and from there, marshalling the power of her mystique 
the sorrowing mother of the martyred infant, and resolute widow of the vanished god, engineers the speedy dismantling of by Congress and the courts of the unconstitutional Wheeler administration, whose criminality in a mere eight days in office has far exceeded that of Warren Harding's Republican administration 20 years earlier. The restoration of orderly democratic procedures initiated by Mrs. Lindbergh culminates two and a half weeks later, on Tuesday, November 3rd, 1942, in a sweep by the Democrats of the House and the Senate, and the landslide victory of Franklin Delano Roosevelt for a third presidential term. The next month, following the devastating surprise attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, and four days later, the declaration of war on the United States by Germany and Italy, America enters the global conflict that had begun in Europe some three years earlier with the German invasion of Poland and had since expanded to encompass two-thirds of the world's population. Disgraced by their collusion with the acting president and demoralized by their colossal electoral defeat, the few Republicans remaining in Congress pledged their support to the Democratic president in his fight to finish and his fight to the finish against the Axis powers. The House and the Senate approve America's going to war without a dissenting vote in either chamber, and the day following his inauguration, President Roosevelt issues Proclamation Number 2568, granting a pardon to Burton Wheeler. In part it reads, As a result of certain acts occurring before his removal from the office of acting president, Burton K. Wheeler has become liable to possession to possible indictment and trial for offenses against the United States. To spare the country the ordeal of such a criminal prosecution against the former acting president of the United States and to protect against the disruption uh, and to protect against the disruptive distraction of such a spectacle during a time of war, I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States, pursuant to the pardon powers conferred upon me by Article 2, Section 6 of the Constitution, have granted and by these presents do grant a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Burton Wheeler for all offenses against the United States which he, Burton Wheeler, has committed or may have committed or taken part in during the period from October 8, 1942 through October 16, 1942. As everyone knows, President Lindbergh was not found or heard from again. Those stories circulated throughout the war and for a decade afterward, along with, with the rumors about other prominent missing persons of that turbulent era, like Martin Bormann, Hitler's private secretary, who was thought to have eluded the Allied armies by escaping to, to Juan Perón's Argentina, but who more likely perished during the last days of Nazi Berlin, and Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish diplomat, whose distribution of Swedish passports saved some 20,000 Hungarian Jews from extermination by the Nazis, although he himself disappeared, probably into a Soviet jail, when the Russians occupied Budapest in 1945. Among the dwindling number of Lindbergh's conspiracy scholars, reports on clues and sightings have continued to appear in intermittently published newsletters devoted to speculation on the unexplored fate of America's 33rd president. The most elaborate story, the most unbelievable story, but not necessarily the least convincing, was first made known to our family by Aunt Evelyn after Rabbi Bengelsdorf's arrest. Her source, none other than Anne Morrow Lindbergh, who allegedly confided the details to the rabbi just days before she was removed from the White House against her will and held prisoner in the psychiatric wing of Walter Reed. Mrs. Lindbergh, reported Rabbi Bengelsdorf, traced everything to the 1932 kidnapping of her infant son Charles, secretly plotted and, she, and financed, she maintained, by the Nazi party shortly before Hitler came to power. According to the rabbi's recapitulation of the First Lady's story, the baby had been passed on for safekeeping by Bruno Hoffmann to a friend living near him in the Bronx, a fellow German immigrant who in, act, who in actuality was a Nazi espionage agent. And only hours after having been lifted from Hopewell, New Jersey, crit, and, ah, and only hours after having been lifted from the Hopewell, New Jersey crib and carried down the makeshift ladder in Hoffman's arms, Charles Jr. had already been smuggled out of the country and was en route to Germany. 
The corpse found and identified as the Lindbergh baby 10, year, 10 weeks later was another child selected by the Nazis to be murdered because of its resemblance to the Lindbergh baby. And then, when the body was already decomposing, planted in the woods near the Lindbergh home to ensure Hoffman's conviction and execution and to keep the secret and to keep secret the true circumstances of the kidnapping from everyone but the Lindberghs themselves. Though a Nazi spy stationed as a foreign newspaper correspondent through a Nazi spy stationed as a foreign news correspondent in New York, the couple had been informed early early on of Charles's arrival, healthy and unharmed on German soil and assured that the best of care would be given him by the by a specially selected team of Nazi doctors, nurses, teachers, and military personnel. Care merited by his status as firstborn son of the world's greatest aviator, provided that the Lindberghs cooperated fully with Berlin. As a result of this threat, for the next ten years, the lot of the Lindberghs and their kidnapped child and gradually the destiny of the United States of America was determined by Adolf Hitler. Through the skill and efficiency of his agents in New York and Washington, and in London and Paris after the celebrated couple complying with orders fled to live as expatriates in Europe, where Lindbergh began regularly to visit Nazi Germany and extol the achievements of its military machine, the Nazis set about to exploit Lindbergh's fame on behalf of the Third Reich and at the expense of America, dictating where the couple would reside, whom they would befriend, and above all, what opinions they would espouse to their public utterance in their public utterances and published writings. In nineteen thirty eight, as a reward for Lindbergh's graciously accepting a prestigious medal from Hermann Goring at a Berlin dinner in the aviator's honor, and after numerous pleading letters that were secretly channeled from Anne Morrow Lindbergh to the Fuhrer himself, the Lindberghs were at last allowed to visit their child by then a handsome fair haired boy of almost eight who, from the day he'd arrived in Germany, had been raised as a model Hitler youth. The German-speaking cadet did not understand, nor was he told, that the famous Americans to whom he and his classmates were introduced following parade exercises at their elite military academy were his mother and father, nor were the Lindberghs permitted to speak to him or be photographed with him. The visit came at just the moment when Anne Marl Lindbergh had concluded that the Nazis' kidnapping story was an unspeakably cruel hoax, and that the time was long overdue for the Lindberghs to free themselves from their bondage to Adolf Hitler. Instead, after seeing Charles alive for the first time since his disappearance in 1932, the Lindberghs left Germany, irreversibly in, the th in thrall to their country's worst enemy.